Sweet Ermengarde by H.P. Lovecraft Chapter 1 A Simple Rustic Maid Ermengarde Stubbs was the beauteous blonde daughter of Hiram Stubbs, a poor but honest farmer bootlegger of Hogden, Vermont. Her name was originally Ethel Ermengarde, but her father persuaded her to drop the prenum in after the passage of the 18th Amendment, averring that it made him thirsty by reminding him of ethyl alcohol, C2H5OH. His own products contained mostly methyl or wood alcohol, CH3OH. Ermengarde confessed to 16 summers, and branded as mendacious all reports to the effect that she was 30. She had large black eyes, a prominent Roman nose, light hair which was never dark at the roots, except when the local drugstore was short on supplies, and a beautiful but inexpensive complexion. She was about 5 foot 3.33 inches tall, weighed 115.47 pounds on her father's copy scales, also off them, and was adjudged most lovely by all the village swains who admired her father's farm and liked his liquid crops. Ermengarde's hand was sought in matrimony by two ardent lovers. Squire Hardman, who had a mortgage on his old home, was very rich and elderly. He was dark and cruelly handsome, and always rode horseback and carried a riding crop. Long had he sought the radiant Ermengarde, and now his ardor was fanned to a fever heat by a secret known to him alone. For upon the humble acres of Farmer Stubbs, he discovered a vein of rich gold. Aha, said he. I will win the maiden ere her parent knows of his unexpected wealth, and join to my fortune a greater fortune still. And so he began to call twice a week, instead of once as before. But alas for the sinister designs of a villain, Squire Hardman was not the only suitor for the fair one. Close by the village dwelt another, the handsome Jack Manley, whose curly yellow hair had won the sweet Ermengarde's affection when both were toddling youngsters at the village school, Jack had long been too bashful to declare his passion, but one day while strolling along a shady lane by the old mill with Ermengarde, he found the courage to utter which was within his heart. "'O oh, light of my life,' said he, "'my soul is so overburdened that I must speak. Ermengarde, my ideal,' he pronounced it, "'ideal. Life has become an empty thing without you. Beloved of my spirit, behold a supplicant kneeling in the dust before thee. Ermengarde, O oh, Ermengarde, Raise me to a heaven of joy and say that you will some day be mine. It is true that I am poor, but have I not youth and strength to fight my way to fame? This can I only do for you, dear Ethel. Pardon me, Ermengarde. My only, my most precious. But here he paused to wipe his eyes and mop his brow, and the fair responded, Jack, my angel, at last. I mean, this is so unexpected and quite unprecedented. I had never dreamed that you entertained sentiments of affection in connection with one so lowly as Farmer Stubbs' child, for I am still but a child. Such is your natural nobility that I feared, I mean, thought, that you would be blind to such slight charms as I possess, that you would seek your fortune in the great city where meeting and wedding one of those more comely damsels whose splendor we observe in fashion books. But, Jack, since it is really I who you adore, let us waive all needless circumlocation. Jack, my darling, my heart has long been susceptible to your manly graces. I cherish an affection for thee. Consider me thy own own, and be sure to buy the ring at Perkins Hardware Store, where they have the nice imitation diamonds in the window. Ermengarde, my love, Jack, my precious, my darling, my own, my God. Curtain. Chapter 2. And the villain still pursued her. But these tender passages, sacred though their fervor, did not pass unobserved by profane eyes, for crouched in the bushes and gritting his teeth was his dastardly squire Hardman. When the lovers had finally strolled away, he leapt out into the lane, viciously twirling his mustache and riding crop, and kicking an unquestionably innocent cat who was also out strolling. Curses, he cried. Hardman, not the cat. I am foiled in my plot to get the farm and the girl, but Jack Manley shall never succeed. I am a man of power, and we shall see. Thereupon he repaired to the humble Stubbs' cottage, where he found the fond father in the still cellar washing bottles under the supervision of the gentle wife and mother, Hannah Stubbs. Coming directly to the point, the villain spoke. Farmer Stubbs, I cherish a tender affection for, of long standing for your lovely offspring, Ethel Ermengarde. I am consumed with love and wish her hand in matrimony. Always a man of few words, I shall not descend to euphemism. Give me the girl, I will foreclose the morge and take the old home. 
But sir, pleaded the distracted subs, while his stricken spouse merely glowered. I'm sure the child's affection are elsewhere placed. She must be mine, sternly snapped the sinister squire. I will make her love me. None shall resist my will. Either she must become my wife, or the old homestead goes. And with a sneer and flick of his riding crop, Squire Hardman strode out into the night. Scarce had he departed, when there entered by the back door the radiant lovers, eager to tell the senior Stubbses of their new fond happiness. Imagine the universal consternation which reigned when all was known. Tears flowed like white ale, till suddenly Jack remembers that he was the hero and raised his head, declaiming in appropriately virile accents, Never shall the fair Ermengarde be offered up to this beast as a sacrifice while I live. I shall protect her. She is mine, 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 and then some. Fear not, dear father and mother-to-be, I will defend you all. You shall have the old farm still. Adverb, uh, not noun, although Jack was by no means out of sympathy for Stubbs' kind of form produce. And I shall lead to the altar the beauteous Ermengarde, loveliest of her sex, to perdition with the cruel squire and his ill-gotten gold. The right shall always win, and the hero is always in the right. I will go to the great city, and there make a fortune to save you all ere the mortgage fall due. Farewell, my love. I leave you now in tears, but I shall return to pay off the mortgage and claim you as my bride. Jack, my protector. Ermie, my sweet roll. Dearest. Darling. Don't forget the ring at Perkins. Oh. Ah. Uh. Curtain. Chapter 3 a dastardly act. But the resourceful Squire Hardman was not so easily to be foiled. Close by the village lay a disreputable settlement of unkempt shacks, populated by shiftless scum who lived by thieving and other odd jobs. Here the devilish villain secured two accomplices, ill-favored fellows who were very clearly no gentlemen. And in the night the th evil three broke into Stubb's cottage and abducted the frail Ermengarde taking her to a wretched hovel in the settlement and placing her there under the charge of Mother Maria, a hideous old hag. Farmer Stubbs was quite distracted, and would have advertised in the papers if the cost had been less than a cent a word for each insertion. Ermagard was firm, and never wavered in a refusal to wed the villain. Aha, my proud beauty, quoth he, I have ye in my power, and sooner or later I will break that will of thine. Meanwhile, Think of your poor old father and mother as turned out of hearth and home and wandering as helpless through the meadows. Oh, spare them, spare them, said the maiden. Never. Ha, 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 leered the brute. And so the cruel days sped on, while all in ignorance young Jack Manley was seeking fame and fortune in the great city. Chapter 4. Subtle Villainy One day as Squire Hardman sat in the front parlor of his expensive and palatial home, Indulging in his favorite pastime of gnashing his teeth and swishing his riding crop, a great thought came to him, and he cursed aloud at the statue of Satan on the onyx mantelpiece. Fool that I am, he cried. Why would I ever waste all this trouble on the girl when I can get the farm by simply foreclosing? I never thought of that. I will let the girl go, take the farm, and be free to wed some fair city maid like the leading lady of the burlesque troupe that played last week at Town Hall. And so he went down to the settlement, apologized to Ermengard, let her go home, and went home himself to plot new crimes and invent new modes of villainy. The days wore on, and the Stubbses grew very sad over the coming loss of their home, and still, but nobody seemed to be able to do anything about it. One day a party of hunters from the city chanced to stray over the old farm, and one of them found gold. Hiding his discovery from his companions, he feigned rattlesnake bite, and went to the Stubbs' cottage for aid of the usual kind. Ermengarde opened the door and saw him. He also saw her, and in that moment resolved to win her and the gold. For my old mother's sake I must, he cried loudly to himself. No sacrifice is too great. Chapter 5 The City Chap Algernon Reginald Jones was a polished man of the world from the great city, and in his sophisticated hands our poor little Ermengarde was as a mere child. One could almost believe that sixteen-year-old stuff. Algy was a fast worker, and never crude. He could have taught Hardman a thing or two about finesse and shrieking. Thus only a week after his advent to the Stubbs family circle, where he lurked like a vile serpent that he was, he had persuaded the heroine to elope. It was in the night that she went leaving a note to her parents. Sniffing the familiar mash for the last time and kissing the cat goodbye, touching stuff. On the train Algernon became sleepy and slumped down in his seat, allowing a paper to fall out of his pocket by accident. 
Ermengarde, taking advantage of her supposed position as bride-elect, picked up the folded sheet and read its perfumed expanse, when, lo, she almost fainted. It was a love letter from another woman. "'Perfidious deceiver!' she whispered to the sleeping Algernon. "'So this is all that your boasted fidelity amounts to. I am done with you for all eternity!' So saying, she pushed him out the window and settled down for a much-needed rest. Chapter 6 Alone in the Great City When the noisy train pulled out into the dark station at the city, poor helpless Ermengarde was all alone without money to get back to Hogden. Oh, why, she sighed in innocent regret, didn't I take his pocketbook before I pushed him out? Oh, well, I should worry. He told me all about this city so I can easily earn enough to get home, if not pay off the mortgage. But alas for our little heroine, work is not easy for a greenhorn to secure. So for a week she was forced to sleep on park benches and obtain food from the breadline. Once a wily and wicked person, perceiving her helplessness, offered her a position as a dishwasher in a fashionable and depraved cabaret. But our heroine was true to her rustic ideals and refused to work in such a gilded and glittering prowess of frivolity, especially since she was only offered three dollars a week, with meals but no board. She tried to look up Jack Manley, her one-time lover, but he was nowhere to be found. Perchance, too, he would not have known her, for in her poverty she had perforce become a brunette again, and Jack had not beheld her in such state since school days. One day she found a neat but costly purse in the dark, and after seeing there was not much in it, took it to the rich lady whose card proclaimed her ownership. Delighted beyond words at her honesty of this forlorn waif, the aristocratic Miss Van Itty adopted Ermengarde to replace the little one who had been stolen from her so many years ago. How like my precious Maud, she sighed, as she watched the fair brunette return to blondness. And so several weeks passed, with the old folks at home tearing their hair and the wicked Squire Hardman chuckling devilishly. Chapter 7 Happily Ever Afterward One day, the wealthy heiress Ermengarde S. Van Itty hired a new second assistant chauffeur. Struck by something familiar in his face, she looked again and gasped. Lo, it was none other than the perfidious Algernon Reginald Jones, whom she had pushed from a car window on that fateful day. He had survived. This much was almost immediately evident. Also, he had wed the other woman, who had run away with his milkman and all the money in the house. Now wholly humbled, he asked forgiveness of our heroine, and confided to her the whole tale of the gold of her father's farm. Moved beyond words, she raised his salary a dollar a month, and resolved to gratify at last that always unquenchable anxiety to relieve the worry of the old folks. So one bright day, Ermengarde motored back to Hogden and arrived at the farm just as Squire Hardman was foreclosing the mortgage and ordering the old folks out. "'Stay, villain!' she cried, flashing a colossal roll of bills. "'You are foiled at last. Here is your money. Now go and never darken our humble door again.' Then followed a joyous reunion, whilst the squire twisted his moustache and riding crop in bafflement and dismay. "'But hark, what is this? Footsteps sound on the old gravel walk. And who should appear but our hero, Jack Manley, worn and seedy but radiant of face? Seeking at once the downcast villain, he said, Squire, lend me a ten spot, will you? I just come back from the city with my beauteous bride, the fair Bridget Goldstein. I need something to start things off on the old farm. Then turning to the Stubbses, he apologized for his inability to pay off the mortgage he as agreed. Don't mention it, said Ermengarde. Prosperity has come to us, and I will consider it sufficient payment if you will forget forever the foolish fancies of our childhood. All this time, Miss Van Itty had been sitting in the motor waiting for Ermengarde. But as she lazily eyed the sharp-faced Hannah Stubbs, a vague memory startled from the back of her brain. Then it all came to her, and she shrieked accusingly at the agrestic matron. You! You, Hannah Smith, I know you now! Twenty-eight years ago, when you were my baby Maud's nurse, and you stole her from the cradle! Where, oh, where is my child? Then a thought came, as the lightning in a murky sky. Ermengarde, you say she is your daughter. She is mine. Fate has restored to me my old shield, my tiny Maudie. Ermengarde, Maudie, come to your mother's loving arms. But Ermengarde was doing some tall thinking. How could she get away with the sixteen-year-old stuff if she'd been stolen twenty-eight years ago? And if she was not Stubbs's daughter, the gold would never be hers. But Miss Van Itty was rich, but Squire Hardman was richer. So approaching the dejected villain, she afflicted upon him the last terrible punishment. 
Squire, dear, she murmured, I have reconsidered all. I love you and your naive strength. Marry me at once, or I will have you prosecuted for kidnapping me last year. Foreclose your mortgage and enjoy with me the gold your cleverness discovered. Come, dear. And the poor dub did. The end.